Westfield is a quiet little town located in the state of New Jersey. It is known for its sleepy hills and the large upscale homes and communities that line them. These sprawling homes are occupied by successful professionals, and like with many places with a high per capita income, the rate of crime is quite low, particularly violent crime. However, there remains one dark stain on the town's reputation, a man named John List, whose horrific crimes in November of 1971 would forever blemish the town's history. I know that this is a more well-known about case than the topics that I usually cover, but even if you've poured over every video and piece of media about this crime before watching this video, then I will offer you something unique about this case that no other video about the topic possibly could. So I urge you to watch this video until the end. So with that being said, let's get started. John Emile List was born on September 17, 1927 in Bay City, Michigan. John was the only child of his two parents, John Frederick List, who I should note was 64 years old at the time of John's birth, and his mother, a woman named Alma Barbara Florence. Being the only child of his parents, John was extremely sheltered in his youth, as his mother would fear that he would get injured or sick constantly, and would seldom allow him to do anything that could put him in harm's way, like playing with other children. The Liss family were active and devout practicing Lutherans, with John Frederick often teaching Sunday school classes, and the younger John would follow in his father's footsteps as he grew into his high school years. John would graduate from Bay City High School a year early in 1943 to enlist in the U.S. military, serving as a lab technician during World War II. However, the following year, in 1944, while still deployed in the service, his father, John Frederick, would die, leaving John with only his mother as his only immediate living family. John would be discharged from the armed services in 1946, and then would enroll at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, going on to earn a bachelor's degree in business administration, and then would also go on to receive a master's degree in accounting from the university as well. In 1950, John would return to active military service to serve in the Korean War, although due to his skill at accounting work, he was reassigned to the Finance Corps, which meant he would not be seeing any combat. While at Fort Eustis in Virginia, John would meet a woman named Helen Morris Taylor, who was a freshly widowed woman after her husband was killed in action in Korea. John and Helen soon began to spark a romance, and soon, Helen claimed that she was pregnant with his child, and so, to avoid the social stigma of having a child outside of wedlock, on December 1st, 1951, the couple were married in Rhode Island. Helen had one child from her previous marriage, a daughter named Brenda. She also had contracted syphilis from her first husband, which she had kept a secret from John, and was the reason they were married in Rhode Island, as Rhode Island did not require a syphilis test to acquire a marriage license. After John completed his service in the Finance Corps in 1952, he found a job as an accountant at an accounting firm in Detroit, Michigan, before being fired from that job. He then found work as an audit supervisor at a paper company in Kalamazoo, Michigan. While working for the paper company, John and Helen would have three children, Patricia in 1955, John Frederick, who I will refer to as Johnny, in 1956, and a third son named Frederick in 1958. Helen was not keen on having Johnny so soon after having Patricia, and had begun drinking heavily to cope with the stresses of her expanding family. By 1959, John had risen through the ranks at the paper company, becoming the general supervisor of the company's accounting department. However, his antisocial tendencies would earn him a negative reputation amongst his co-workers, as List was obsessive-compulsive and was a harsh manager that preferred things be done his way. The following year, in 1960, Helen's daughter from her first marriage, Brenda, would turn 18 years old and marry and leave the household, despite John's disapproval. And not long after, John was fired from the paper company, but soon found another job in Rochester, New York, with a small company at the time known as Xerox. By 1965, he once again had risen through the ranks at Xerox, becoming the director of accounting services at the company. However, after demanding that Xerox give him a raise or fire him, 
he once again found himself without employment. However, it was also in 1965 that List would be offered a position as the vice president and comptroller at the First National Bank of Jersey City and would look to move the family to a large 19-room house on 431 Hillside Avenue in Westfield, New Jersey. However, they were unable to afford the down payment due to Helen's frivolous spending habits, so John would ask his mother, Alma, to cover the down payment. She agreed with the stipulation that she be allowed to live in the house, and despite much protest from Helen, John agreed and moved her into a separate portion of the house on the third floor. On the surface, all seemed to be going well for the Liss family in their new extravagant home, although they were known to be a rather reclusive family, with few friends outside of their Lutheran church community, which John was a very active member of. John's job at the bank allowed them to keep up with their increasingly lavish lifestyle, as Helen was a compulsive spender. However, this new job wouldn't last for long, as John was once again fired as he was unable to meet his duties as vice president to add accounts to the bank due to his lack of social skills. John was humiliated and refused to tell his family that he had lost his job to keep up the facade that they were a well-off and successful family. For the next six months, he would pretend to leave for work, but would instead mill about at the train station or apply for other jobs. By the late 1960s, Helen began to suffer health complications from her syphilis and heavy drinking, and the already aloof Helen began to spend almost all of her time in her room reading books, which she could allegedly finish two of in a day. By this time, John's obsessive compulsive disorder had continued to worsen as well as he was known for his meticulously deliberate mannerisms and would even trim his lawn by hand sometimes. Shortly after she was hospitalized due to her health issues, Helen would stop attending church and would ask John to tell them to remove her from their registry, which greatly upset him. In order to keep up the facade of their lavish life, John would find some work selling insurance and demanded that the children find jobs in order to teach themselves responsibility and bring in more income. However, this was still not enough to cover the expenses of the family, and John began to take money from his mother's bank account, justifying it to himself as a loan that he'd pay back later. However, somewhat unsurprisingly, by 1971, Alma's bank account had been nearly drained, and rather than face the shame of admitting that their house was facing foreclosure, John hatched a plan to eliminate his family instead. John had decided that he would be the one to end his family's lives and figured he'd need to acquire a gun permit in order to acquire a gun. But after he submitted his application, he decided to forego this formality as he was already in possession of two firearms, a 9mm stair pistol he had purchased in Europe while in the military, and a 22 caliber Colt revolver belonging to his father that he kept in the basement. On November 5th, 1971, John would ominously tell his children that they would die soon and ask them whether they'd prefer to be buried or cremated after they had died. After the three less children apprehensively answered that they'd prefer to be buried rather than cremated, he took Patricia to a drama practice at her school, where a noticeably shaken up Patty would tell her teacher that she feared that her father was going to kill her soon. The teacher, who was used to dealing with dramatic teenagers, brushed off the comment, although he would later state that he could sense in her body language that she seemed serious. Four days later, on November 9th, 1971, John Liss would set his plan into motion. The first victim of his murder spree was his wife, Helen. He shot her in the back of the head in the dining room as she sat at the table in her bathrobe sipping coffee. Fearing that his mother Alma had heard the commotion downstairs, John would then rush to her apartment on the third floor, where he found her in her kitchen. She asked him what the noise was about before he pointed the gun at her. She yelled at him, Are you crazy? before John shot her with the 9mm stare in the head, killing her. After killing his mother, John went to the basement to retrieve some sleeping bags, which he then laid out on the floor of the ballroom. He then dragged Helen's body to the ballroom and placed her on the sleeping bags. He left his mother in her upstairs apartment, as he reasoned it would be too great an effort to bring her down to the ballroom. John would then spend some time cleaning up the mess, although his plan didn't require that he try to hide any evidence. 
He was just so consumed by his obsessive compulsions that he couldn't stand to leave such a mess. After cleaning up a bit, John would then cancel a meeting he had scheduled in the afternoon and would begin going about canceling all deliveries and services to the house, and mailed a key to his desk to the house at the post office as he hoped that the officers that would find the gruesome scene would find it and use it to unlock his desk rather than simply break into it. He then headed to the bank and withdrew the remaining $2,800 left in his mother's account. After making the withdrawal, he called his church and the children's schools, informing them that they would be leaving town for a while to visit Helen's ailing mother in North Carolina, a half-truth, as she was suffering from health issues and had recently canceled a trip to visit them. He then returned to the house and began to write some letters explaining his rationale for murdering his family. However, as he was doing this, the phone rang. It was Patty. She had been feeling unwell at school and asked John to come pick her up early, a request which John begrudgingly obliged. When they arrived back at the house, John raced inside to get there before Patricia got inside in order to avoid her stumbling across the grisly scene in the ballroom and managed to do so, meeting her near the back entrance where he shot her in the head with the stair 9mm pistol, killing her. He then dragged her body to the ballroom and set it down next to Helen's. Later that afternoon, John picked up Frederick and brought him back to the house. Freddy was eager to rush inside to feed the fish they kept in tanks in the kitchen, and despite John's efforts to beat him inside, he was unsuccessful. However, Freddy didn't stumble across the horrifying scene in the ballroom, and John managed to approach him in the kitchen as he finished feeding the fish and shot him with the 9mm pistol, killing him. Not long after doing so, John noticed a car pulling up to the house. It was Johnny, who was supposed to be at a soccer practice, but it had been cancelled and he had caught a ride home early. John panicked and tried to hide in order to ambush his son. However, Johnny sensed that something was amiss in the house and soon spotted his father pointing the gun at him. He attempted to flee, but was shot by John in the back with the stair 9mm pistol. However, this shot did not kill Johnny, and he continued to attempt to flee. Johnny was hit by another bullet in the side of his head, which badly wounded the teen, but similarly did not kill him. Johnny then attempted to crawl away from John, but John approached him and shot him in the forehead. After shooting him in the forehead, John noticed that Johnny's eyes were still fluttering in his head, and his son's refusal to die frustrated John who then fired the remaining rounds in the stair 9mm into his chest, and then fired all the rounds of the 22 Colt revolver into his chest as well, for a total of 10 shots. He then brought Johnny's body to the living room and set him on the sleeping bags next to his siblings and mother. Now with his entire family dead, John then cleaned up the mess as best he could before finishing his letters that detailed his rationale for the slayings. He wrote a five-page note addressed to his pastor at the Lutheran Church, revealing the state of the family's financial woes, and it was in this letter that he stated that he felt that he would rather have sent his family to heaven than have them live on welfare, and expressed that he feared his wife leaving the church and his daughter's interest in drama could possibly stray them away from being active practitioners of the faith. He then locked the letters in a locked drawer in a locked cabinet, meticulously leaving the keys for each of the drawers inside for investigators to find, as he didn't want the investigators to simply break it open due to his obsessive compulsions. He then would spend the night at the house and departed the scene the following day, November 10th, after setting the radio to the classical music station on the intercom system in the house. He then dumped the family car at the John F. Kennedy Airport to throw investigators off his trail, and then boarded a train that took him first back to Michigan, and then to Denver, Colorado, where he would purchase a trailer home with the remainder of the money he had taken from his mother's bank account, and he requested a new social security card, assuming the identity of a former classmate at the University of Michigan, a man named Robert Clark. Almost a month after the murders, on December 7, 1971, police officers were dispatched to the home to investigate the inside of the residence, as it was reported by neighbors that the lights had been left on constantly, with no apparent movement inside. Inside the home, they were met with the horrific scene of the murdered family members who had been left inside for nearly a month at this point. An investigation was launched, and the FBI were soon involved as well. It didn't take them long to find the car at JFK, 
but after tracing every passenger that had departed from the airport around the time of the murders, the investigation's track went cold. After receiving his new social security card, List, now going by Bob, was beginning to run out of money, so he found a job as a cook at a Holiday Inn in Denver. He would soon be fired from this job at the Holiday Inn for being too slow, but would find similar but higher paying work as a cook at a country club, along with some freelance accounting work on the side. Robert, still a devout Lutheran, soon began attending church again as he grew more comfortable with his new identity, and in the spring of 1977, he met a woman named Dolores Miller. Unlike his first marriage, John, or Bob, would take his courtship of Dolores much slower than he had with Helen, and would only marry her much later in 1985. While living in Denver, a neighbor who had heard of the widely publicized murders noticed an uncanny resemblance between John List and the man she knew as Bob Clark. From his devout Lutheran faith, to his job doing accounting, to his appearance, which matched down to very specific surgery scars, and so she decided to confront Dolores about it. However, Dolores was adamant that it couldn't possibly be him, but the neighbor asked her to confront him about it, which Dolores begrudgingly agreed to do. However, Dolores would later tell the neighbor that she did not confront Bob about the neighbor's suspicions, and she felt there was no possibility that Bob could do something so horrific. Not long after the couple were married, Bob was yet again fired from his job and unable to provide for himself and Dolores, and after failing to get his own accounting business off his feet in 1988, 17 years after the murders, John found work doing accounting for a shipping company in the Richmond area of Virginia, with Dolores joining him there not long after. In 1989, a new television program named America's Most Wanted would begin to air, and the show quickly became a favorite of John's. However, somewhat ironically, it just so happens that one of the episodes that John was not able to catch featured him in a reconstruction of what he would likely look like at this stage in his life, which turned out to be pretty accurate to how he looked. The neighbor back in Denver that had suspected that Bob was actually List recognized him on the TV and called in a tip about it, and after following up this lead, on June 1st, 1989, investigators would arrive at his home in Virginia, but would find only Dolores there. After confronting her about the evidence that her husband was actually John List, she reluctantly told them where he worked. One officer was left at the house with Dolores, while the rest of the officers headed to find Bob at his workplace. After taking List into custody and confronting him, he adamantly denied that he was John List and was insistent that investigators referred to him as Bob Clark. However, the investigators were not so easily fooled, but managed to convince him to allow them to extradite him back to New Jersey with the stipulation that the paperwork referred to him as Robert Clark. After his extradition to New Jersey, Bob Clark would continue to insist that he was not John List and pled not guilty to the murder charges. During the trial, his legal team focused in on the letter that he had written confessing the crimes that he had left in the filing cabinet, which investigators just smashed open by the way, and his team tried to get this letter removed as admissible evidence due to confidentiality. However, it was found that the wording of the letter did not prove that it was only meant for the pastor to read it, and on April 12, 1990, John List was convicted of five counts of first-degree murder, receiving five life sentences to be served consecutively. List would file two further appeals to his convictions. The first appeal again rehashed that the letter should not have been admitted as evidence, and was rejected. And in his second appeal, he claimed that he suffered from PTSD due to his time in the military, despite seeing no combat at all during his military career which was also rejected. John List died in prison on March 21st, 2008, at the age of 81 due to complications from pneumonia. These awful murders committed by an awful man have certainly left a mark on the town of Westfield, and the case remains a fascinating one to many true crime fanatics as there is still much mystery surrounding the family and what it was really like inside the house located at 431 Hillside Avenue. Now, if you've watched up to this point and are still familiar with everything I've covered already, worry not, dear viewer. To answer some of these questions about what it was like inside the List home, 
I'd like to introduce my mother, who happened to be List's neighbor, and was friends with Patty and Johnny, as they were all of a similar age. So without further ado, please, welcome Morbid Mom. So, how did you become friends with the List children? It was the summertime, and I really needed some new play friends. I was about nine years old in 1965, and yeah, from my bedroom window, I could see over to their property because we were neighbors. So one day, I think I noticed children playing outside, and I was a kid, and I needed some new friends. So my mom said I could go over there and find out who they were. So I walked over. I walked through some neighbors' yards, and I went into their backyard, and that's where I met Patty, and I met Johnny, and I met Freddie. They were outside riding their bicycles in their driveway in back of their house. And yeah, it's really easy to make friends when people, are, kids are new in town and they obviously just moved there because I recognized new friends playing out back. So I went to join the fun. So what was the List family like? Well, of course, when I first went into their backyard and they were playing outside, I immediately became friends with Patty. She was about a year, year and a half older than I was, and she was taller than I was, and she was very pretty. She had long, long blonde hair, almost down to her waist, and she wore a hairband, and she parted her hair in the middle, sometimes a little bit to the side. And then I also, when I first met them, I met Johnny and Freddie. Johnny was uh, her next oldest brother, and he was like a year younger than me. And uh, yeah, he was really friendly. He had bright, bright, sparkly eyes and a big smile. I really liked Johnny. I really feel like as a nine-year-old, I had a crush on Johnny. He was uh, really bright and cheerful and smiley, and he rode his bike really fast, and I liked to chase him around. Then I met Freddie. He was the littlest brother, and he was like two years younger than me. Freddie was sweet. He was short and sweet and he was shy and he didn't say much and he didn't run as fast as, as Johnny and, and Freddie, well, yeah, he, he was kind of quiet, but, and he didn't have as much energy as Johnny. However, he just hung around to be with us outdoors. Uh, the both boys, they never went with me. When, we, when Patty and I were playing with dolls, they definitely were doing other stuff. And I wanted to comment about both Johnny and Freddie's hair that, well, in those days, boys their age had the, you know, pretty short hair, crew cut and short hair tops. And I just felt like Johnny and Freddie were a little bit unkempt, like their hair was longer, hanging into their eyes. Uh, so they kinda, they're kind of like wild and, well, they were wild, actually, because they really didn't have any parental supervision. And I wanted to comment that I never went upstairs to Johnny or Freddie's bedroom. I It was toward the back of the house, but I never went in there. Uh, they were kind of, I don't know, they, they were pretty wild running around and had a lot of energy. And I liked all of them. Uh, they were kind of, they were energized and we loved riding bicycles out in the backyard in the driveway and uh, yeah and we even hauled our bicycles indoors and we had row rally bicycle races in the ballroom round and round on that wonderful big wooden floor yeah and the sunbeams would come in that ballroom when we played in there in the late day it was really fun they were really fun fun kids um we used to enter the house through the back door the back door um was always open. I never had to ring any doorbells. We would go, I would go in and in the kitchen. I play with them in the afternoon because that's when we all, it was like after lunch and before dinner. I do remember that um, when we were in the kitchen together because that's where we would meet in the backyard or in the kitchen. There was always a plate of cookies for us to eat in my memory and from the kitchen window, I would always, when we were sitting there, enjoying a plate of cookies after we played outside, 
I always remembered looking at their dad, who they called father. They addressed him as father. I watched him mow that lawn every time I went there to play with them. Their father was mowing the lawn, John List, back and forth, back and forth, the same direction, from the front of the house to the back of the house, front of the house, the back of the house. And that guy, their father, I thought he was so weird. You know, usually when people mow the lawn, they tend to look around, you know, look at the ground, look back, look to the side about mowing the lawn, but his head never moved. His eyes were always straight and he was like robotical in his motions. I just thought he was so strange. He never said hello to me. He never acknowledged my existence, he never came into the kitchen to say hello to his children. I never experienced a meal there. I never saw the mom walk around and I never saw the grandma walk around. So on the very hot days when we got tired of bicycling out back, Patty would take me upstairs to her room and her room had two windows in it. She had a front front house facing room and we loved playing with our Barbie dolls and Francie dolls on the floor in her bedroom and her bedroom was full of sunshine and yeah, it was really fun playing with Patty up there. Sometimes we would walk down the hallway and we'd walk past her mom's room. And I remember her mom never came out of her bedroom. Her mother never came out of her bedroom. Sometimes the mom's room was ajar. And one time Patty opened the door and she said, hello, mother, do you need anything? And I was right there with Patty and I noticed the mom was sitting in the chair and there was like a cloud of cigarette smoke filling the air and I could smell very hard alcohol. I mean, I knew that the mom drank and I never saw the mom come out of her bedroom. The mother never interacted with her children and neither did their father, John List, ever interact with the children when I was there. And I played with them at least two and three hours at a time all afternoon. And then the, the most scary part for me was the mystery of the grandmother. Uh, apparently, they called her grandmother, Patty did. The, I could hear the footsteps of the grandmother pacing, pacing on the floor above the mother's bedroom and Patty's bedroom. Uh, the grandmother was pacing upstairs on the third floor. And sometimes she would get really frustrated and be howling and yelling at the top of her voice and that was very frightening for me as a child not knowing who was up there and you could hear the grandmother rattling on the door she was locked in there and i would ask patty why doesn't what's wrong with your grandmother and patty never answered me um, obviously as a child i could tell that the grandmother was crazy from the yelling and screaming and the commotion, the footsteps, that was really spooky. That's so fascinating. Can you describe what the house's interior looked like in more detail? Why, yes. Um, I did mention that um, I always walked through backyards to get to their home every every day in the summer times. We must have played, we played every day in the summertime for at least two months. And yeah, Patty and I, uh, we we just spoke about our favorite um, toys and our dolls and our our bike rides and our running around and we always entered and exited the house through the back door, the kitchen, in the what led to the kitchen. And I remember every time we went into the kitchen, it was it was crazy clean. It was immaculately clean. Um, the table, it was always cleared away and it was shiny. It had a metal strip around it and a white top and the counters were always clear. Like it was as, as if no one ever prepared food in there. And it was completely clean. And yeah, I I don't even know who prepared the food because the mom didn't seem capable of coming out of her room. And the grandmother was like, non-existent in their life, meaning they never wanted to talk about her because she obviously was like an animal locked up 
in her room. So, um, yeah, we hung out in the kitchen when we were resting from bike riding out back or running around. And they had a huge uh, outdoor lot covered with grass. So, naturally, that's why Mr. List stayed outside just mowing that lawn because it must have been two or three acres of lawn to mow. And also, it was uh, graded in little slopes and hills. So, yeah, he was preoccupied with perfecting his lawn mowing while we played. And like I mentioned, um, I have no memory of the living room because I remember the downstairs, the first floor was sparse, like not furnished. The furniture was like not there. Uh, the ballroom, we played in a lot and there was n no furniture in that ballroom. Um, it had very beautiful windows. I remember as a child, I feel like they were almost like stained glass when the sun shone, because the sun came in in the later day, in the late afternoon, it came through the top windows and it illuminated that ballroom in ways that I remember we used to run in there so much and play ball and ride bike that it stirred up the dust. I would say that that ballroom was not very clean and it was dusty. So the dust would waft off the floors and we played and the light would be coming in and it was kind of like misty and foggy there in my memory we had loads of fun in there screaming yelling johnny and freddie and patty and i and that ballroom was our favorite and then going up the front staircase to patty's bedroom like i described uh, we turned to the right and she was to the that right hand front of the house when the sun would come in it was south sun and the western sun so her room was very bright and cheerful and she had white furnishings and she had little trinkets around her room like a normal 10, 11 year old girl would. And yeah, we played dolls there. It was very bright and cheery. And yeah, down the hallway, like I said, I could smell the cigarette smoke and the alcohol. I knew that as a child. And I never, I only saw the mom once. The mother, she never came out of her room. and. Her room was um, also facing the front. She had two windows in her bedroom too. So it was, it was, well, it, what can I describe it? It was an adult bedroom and she sat in a winged chair. She seemed to be preoccupied re with reading and drinking and smoking, yeah. And she, she wore a bathrobe in my memory. I never saw her in clothing, never once. And then of course I already described what I heard about the grandmother upstairs was definitely um, like an animal caged in a room. We never went up the stairs. We never talked about her. It was like, it was, too, it was just too much. So obviously there were some strange things going on in that house. Is there anything else you remember that seemed a bit off about the atmosphere? Uh, that first summer that I played with them, uh, no, I already, describe some of the slight off things. But after that first summer that we played together, uh, Patty, Freddie, and Johnny, they went to a different school than I did in the fall. And uh, so we all went to different schools. And so it was sad that um, the next summer, my mom didn't want me to play with Patty anymore because she was becoming like a tween, you know, so she had different friends and um, she did different things. So. Yeah, our, our little friendship ended, and so I wasn't really allowed to play with them anymore. So I really didn't notice anything about their house. And, you know, years later, when the murders did happen, I didn't notice anything about their house that was strange either. So what was your reaction to the crime when you heard about it? Okay, yeah, that was pretty dramatic, I have to say it. I was about 14 at that time, and my parents were sheltering me when they found out that Patty, Freddie, and Johnny, and their mother and grandmother were murdered, and the bodies were piled in the ballroom. My parents didn't want me to know all the horrible details. However, it was, it was shocking. There were so many pictures in the newspaper, and in those days, the newspaper was everywhere, so I did see photographs of their bodies in the ballroom and I'll never forget that. I just, it was like I felt that horrible pit in my stomach. I, I was crying and I, 
I mean, I had the, we had the best summer together and there were my friends, okay, that, that was six, six years later, but there they were murdered in our favorite play, playroom, the ballroom. It was just, it was just horrible. It was, it was just like a nightmare. Do you remember anything about the fire that happened later in 1972? Oh, yes, I do, because um, the fire was in August, like a week and a half before my slated uh, big Sweet 16 party that we were going to have at our, our house uh, with my friends from high school. And yeah, I remember on the night, that fateful night of the fire, I guess it was August 13th that I woke up to hearing crackling fire, smelling smoke, big black hurls of smoke and seeing flames right through my bedroom windows. And I sprung out of bed and I looked toward Patty and Freddie and Johnny's house. And we could, I could see it burning down. I mean, I'll, I'll just never forget. It was, it was crazy upsetting. So who do you think started the fire? Oh, uh, um, since we were f friends with all the neighbors and all, we just thought it was a random deed. It was either some random person who just wanted to try to gain attention. We don't think it was anybody in the neighborhood. So, Mom, do you have any lasting memories that you'd like to share about the children? Yes, um, I really do. It was one of the happiest summers of my life, finding a new new friends right next door to me practically. And I loved playing with Patty and she was really close girlfriend. We had a lot of laughs and she was so pretty and she had the best toys. And like I said, I had a crush on Johnny and we did so much running and screaming and having fun outside and yeah, a little sweet Freddie. And it was kind of an idyllic child situation. You know, the parents were never around and, they were uninvolved in their children's life. And so it was a, just such a beautiful summer and such a fine memory. I'll never forget it. Wow, that's fantastic. Thanks so much for being in the video, Mom, and sharing all that with us. I really hope you all enjoyed this special video, and thank you all for watching.